if you tell people, here are the things that happened and here are the concerns that actual experts have about what might happen should Donald Trump be reinaugurated in 2025, the people say, oh, those all those sound bad, right? The challenge is not only would you have to sit down with everyone with that pollster, you'd also have to do it two seconds before they vote <laughs> because otherwise they're just re-immersed in the bad information universe and then things go sideways again very quickly. Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right, and I'm guest host A.B. Stoddard of the Bulwark, sitting in for Mona Charon today. Joining me are Damon Linker, who publishes Substack Notes from the Middle Ground, Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, and our special guest today is Philip Bump of the Washington Post. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this has been the most amazing, I think, uh, really starting around the first week of February, crush of consequential news uh, that will not only shape the 2024 race, but I think the country for years to come. Uh, we're not going to have Donald Trump going to trial beyond his porn star hush money case at the end of March. I don't really know what that's going to do. But everyone who was hoping that they would, on the Republican side, impeach Joe Biden, it doesn't look like that'll happen. On the Democratic side, see a conviction for Donald Trump. But we are at the dreaded general election with the two people uh, that we knew would be the nominees and that the American public um, just doesn't want. To, to choose from. So I want to focus on what the race is going to look like. And we all know that um, since you last met, there was just horrible polling um, out of the New York Times over the weekend, the New York Times Siena poll for Joe Biden. But it was completely consistent with all of the polling that we've seen for these general election matchups. So no, they weren't officially um, in control of delegates and nominees and waiting. But now we're looking at this race for real. And those numbers, again, every trend line is the same. Um, so I want to open with you, Bill. You just wrote about this Biden's coalition that he put together in 2020 and that the Democrats hope have held together in the 2022 midterms and all these special elections is really weakening. Um, a dramatic swing, I think you, you wrote, of 6.6% points nationally from his win um, to where he is in polling now. But then some of the stretches, some of the swings are far worse with, with key subgroups. Talk, talk about what's happened um, to the Biden voting electorate. One adjective to apply to the coalition is fraying, but there are parts of it that seems to, seem to be collapsing altogether. You know, on the, on the fraying side, and this is really hard to believe. Uh, his his reported support among African Americans is down to 66 percent, and 23 percent of African Americans say they're going to vote for Donald Trump. That would be an earthquake if it happened. Uh, and I'm not saying it's going to happen. Uh, we're look just looking at snapshots, but the snapshots are are disturbing. His margin among Young voters, ages 18 to 29, down double digits. And astonishingly, the New York Times found that Donald Trump is actually leading Joe Biden among Hispanics by six percentage points. Uh, I'm trying to find a noun to describe that outcome if it, were going, if, if it came to pass. And, uh, you know, I have, I have a pretty good internal thesaurus, but I can't find one. Uh, and uh, I am pretty sure that if the election were held tomorrow, Donald Trump would win it. Uh, and the swing, the 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 polls on the swing states, although obviously in many cases less reliable than the national polls, are dismal in the southern tier: Georgia, Arizona, Nevada. There's been a swing of more than ten points against. Biden in Nevada, and I suspect that reflects his weakness among Hispanic voters in heavily in heavily Hispanic Nevada. Uh, the The northern tier, uh, Wisconsin, is within reach. He's leading in Pennsylvania, but Michigan is a real trouble spot. 
And it doesn't take advanced math to see that if the southern tier is in trouble for Biden, Michigan becomes the pivotal state in the election, which means that the issues that are creating, are creating difficulties for him become the pivotal issues in Michigan, in Michigan and nationally. So I wish, I wish I could find some good news in this poll uh, for the fans and supporters of Joe Biden, of whom I'm one. Uh, but I can't see any right now, and, uh, and they, they will have to be betting a lot on the ability of the campaign and events to turn things around. So, Phil, what we hear from the campaign, and we have for a really long time, because the polls have been consistently bad since the summer, is people aren't paying attention. Oh, my gosh, Donald Trump is a disaster. It's going to be great. We have so much money. We're going to start our ad campaign. So there are things that Bill wrote about in the Wall Street Journal that could turn things around, right? <clears throat> Events like, well, first of all, people were promised a recession and they're not getting one. Perhaps there are rates that go down and make people feel better towards September. Joe Biden gets a ceasefire, maybe even gets closer to some kind of a two-state solution, which is not only just stopping the bleeding literally, but maybe even looks like a win, um, whatever, things that could happen that could make it better. But just in terms of the power of persuasion, that is what they keep telling us, that they just are getting started. Do you believe in this, in 2024, given the headwinds against him on real substantive issues, that the power of advertising um, and surrogates and messaging is going to, I know they're well resources, resourced, but do you think they can turn it around? Yeah, I mean, look, we're talking about polling. I mean, this is this is a, a standard response to these sorts of things. We're talking about polling eight months in advance, right? Right. Sure, fine, great, right? You know, I mean, there was, I saw a thing the other day that reminded me that, that you know, John McCain was leading in the summer of 2008. Things turn around, things change, right? Um, there, there are a lot of ways in which one can look at the, the crosstabs of polls and, and, and if you are a Biden supporter, become particularly alarmed. I, I understand that. This was always going to be a close race. I think it's still going to be a close race. Uh, and uh, we will see the extent to which those numbers change over time. If this, if this, if that poll were to come out on October fifteenth, yeah, I feel like if I'm Joe Biden, that I'm that I'm panicking. All of that said, to answer your question, yes, I do think it is true that a lot of Americans are not really paying attention. I think the better question is, will they be paying more attention by November? Or are they simply saying, here we go again, it's these same two guys, I used to like Biden, I don't like him at all anymore, I'm just not going to show up. I think that this dynamic of Biden's popularity dropping, particularly among black voters, particularly among younger voters, I think that's really central to what's going to happen over the course of the year. And I think one of the things that is under-recognized is that Biden's push in part on this democracy argument, which obviously is a very valid argument, the concerns about Donald Trump you know, coming back into office have real validity when we're talking about the sanctity of democracy. It is also an argument, though, that takes the focus away from Biden. And it makes it a Trump-focused election. We're already seeing polls that show that people who support Biden, most of them are voting as a response to Donald Trump, which was the same thing that happened in 2020 and helped Biden win. But I think the democracy argument in part targets that. If you are a young person, you are an independent, you're not tightly associated with the Democratic Party, you don't really care about the party, but you recognize that the party shares your values more, but then you ha you, you're focusing on Joe Biden, you really don't like Joe Biden, he's too old, you don't like him, yada, yada, yada. You may, however, be compelled by this democracy argument. You may be compelled by this other issue that is out there. And I think that's the sort of thing that over the course of the next eight months, the Biden campaign is really going to focus on. Look, you may not like me. You may not think I've done a great job. Of course, I'm not going to say that, but you get the point. You may not like me, but at the end of the day, here's why this election is important. And that may be the thing that then compels people to come out. And of course, when we talk about uh, African-American voters, when we talk about young voters, turnout is really the key. Uh, and if you can make that compelling argument and get people to turn out, then suddenly the ball game changes. All right. So, Linda, um, we are going to get we're going to get back to that um, Americans focusing on the democracy dictator um, question in a minute. But I want to ask you about abortion and IVF. These, this is another thing that the the Biden campaign has been saying for a long time since the twenty twenty two midterm, since the Dobbs v Jackson decision that this is it. This is it. They it's kryptonite. This is it. Republicans can't come back from this. They have no answer on it. How potent do you think? Literally, if, if you talk to, to Democrats 
about this panic, about these polls. They go, oh, Trump so bad and abortion. It's sort of like that's their default. What do you think about the salience of that? It has driven a lot of turnout. It has energized a lot of engagement, money, voter registration, mobilization. I mean, there's no question that it is delivered. What do you think about it in a general electorate, which is different in a presidential year? Well, first of all, I think the abortion issue itself is going to be on the ballot in a number of key states, including, I believe, Arizona. Uh, There are a whole list of them where there are going to be ballot initiatives uh, to try to protect abortion rights in, in certain states. And that, I think, will be very helpful particularly with young women, uh, but also young men. Uh, I think that the whole problem, not the whole problem, but at least a part of the problem, as Bill suggested, is turnout and whether or not uh, young voters are going to actually go to the polls and show up and and vote as they did last time. Uh, If they don't, the election is lost. And the same is true of black voters and others. So if abortion uh, is on the ballot uh, in key states, I think it will drive voter turnout. And I think that will be helpful. But I have to tell you, I am more pessimistic this week than I have I think ever been during about this election. You know, the the problem is as much as as Joe Biden would like to talk about how good the economy is, et cetera, how much he's done, how much he's accomplished, and even in the face of a do nothing Congress, unless people feel it in their own lives, and they should be feeling it. I mean, real wages have gone up uh, and they've gone up more uh, for people at the low income um, sectors. But if they don't feel it, if they don't have this sense that America's on the upswing, I think it's very difficult to persuade them of that. And so then you have to give them some alternative. And while I absolutely agree with Philip that to, certainly to people around this uh, table, uh, the whole question of democracy and the future of our uh, republic uh, is certainly uh, enough motivator for someone like me who is not really in agreement with Joe Biden on a lot of his issues to get out there and vote again for him because the alternative is so unacceptable. But I worry and I am pessimistic. Maybe it's because I spend too much time reading uh, Russian novels. But I just finished uh, reading for the second time uh, The Brothers Karamazov. And the very famous chapter in that book uh, called The Grand Inquisitor is an argument between Christ, who comes back to earth, and the Grand Inquisitor. And uh, in that argument, Christ loses. And he loses because the Grand Inquisitor understands that people don't necessarily want freedom. This idea that we all want freedom, I'm not so sure that that's uh, actually true that there are a great many of people who simply want stability and predictability. And they feel like their lives uh, were more stable. They they feel like there was less crime, that the economy was doing better uh, until the pandemic hit uh, under Donald Trump uh, than they do today. Now, I think that's irrational. I don't think it's, uh, it's right. But if that is why we're seeing these kinds of polls, And, you know, I hate to throw in an anecdotal uh, report uh, on this because Bill, you know, has given us all this great data. And and Philip, of course, does it every every week. Uh, But, you know, I rode in an Uber this week on my way to the airport uh, with a black Uber driver, uh, a very um, talkative fellow who wanted to tell me the world was going to hell in a handbasket. And he talked about crime. He talked about what's happening in the schools and how he's going to have to take his kids out of public school because he can't stand what's happening there. And I started bringing up gingerly, you know, Trump. And I didn't really say very much when I brought up Trump. But when I mentioned Biden, he said, well, you can't support Biden, can you? And I thought, oh, my goodness. If, you know, I mean, if he is in any way emblematic of a guy in his uh late 50s or early 60s, uh, who has an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and he is, is uh, entertaining, clearly, the idea of voting for Trump, then we are in real trouble. I think that's clear uh, from the polling uh, that Biden is going to depend on older African-American voters 
who still um, approve of him, but the, his hemorrhaging of support with younger black voters is um, it's real because it's in every poll. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we are going to return, as, as I promised, to this question about democracy in a second. But uh, Damon, Nikki Haley gets, we're going to get to Trump. Let's talk about Nikki Haley. She's out of the race. She ran, I, I think she's a phony and I don't trust her uh, two inches in front of me. She ran what I think was an incredibly disciplined and effective campaign for a year. And I will give her that. She is leaving us guessing on what she's going to do. Um, you have a, a great piece out about how her campaign was fueled by the fading fumes of Reaganism. And you want her to burn the GOP to the ground. Take the floor. Well, um, th this is not uh, an example of a... a a post or a column written from uh, the position of of hard-nosed realism about what will happen. I think this is extremely unlikely, but I thought it was useful not only for my own sense of catharsis to write such a post, but to kind of think through the dynamics between the parties at this moment. I really have to say, after eight years, I am very tired of people who are Republicans in that old school sense, of people who strongly supported Reagan, the first Bush, the second Bush, then the campaigns of John McCain and Mitt Romney, who are still, after eight years of this circus under Trump, trying to hold on to a, like some tiny outcropping of rock from which they fantasize they will get their chance again. There will be a restoration. <clears throat> Nikki Haley, no, oh no, not 2024, but four years from now, I'll be back. Trump will lose, and then I'll have my chance, and we'll, we'll be back to 2004 again. I think this is delusional, and ironically, Haley's campaign has definitively shown that, that this is a delusion at this point. Nikki Haley did run a very powerful campaign. She bested all the competition, came out on top as the alternative to Trump, and then stayed in the race with considerable resources for a long time. And what did we learn? She won about a quarter of Republican votes in many places. But in the South, she won somewhere between 14 to 20 percent of the votes of Republican voters. Um, and then also did very badly in California and Alaska and other places. This is not the future of the Republican Party. This is the past of the Republican Party. And I would love it if Nikki Haley would stop being cautious and self-absorbed and self-regarding. And instead of trying to somehow maneuver things so she can stay in play for the future, if she would just say, look, I don't love Joe Biden. I've never voted for the Democrats, but this is a special situation. And the people in the party who voted for me, millions of them, should, for the moment, vote for the Democratic Party because this Republican Party is a threat to the United States and through that, the world, and it must burn. And so we're going to do that. And, you know, when we move over to the Democratic Party, we will get some leverage because that's a lot of people. <laughs> and it will change the dynamic in lots of local races and state races to have us now tilting to the center left. And just as the Reagan revolution had the effect of sort of forcing the Democrats to hew to the center left for a generation with Bill Clinton, then even with Barack Obama, uh, and, uh, and so on. I think, and with Biden, I think that those forces will be strengthened if those voters actually move across the aisle you know, not not promising to do it forever, but to do it for this election, and then we'll see how does the how does the Democratic Electoral Coalition shift when you have this tilt over 
to uh, the Democrats. I w- that's the only path where I actually see what could be a more positive future for the other party, the right-leaning party. Whether it's a burning of the current GOP and it being reconstituted under the same name later after it loses, say, with 40% of the vote, um, with all those Haley voters leaving, or it simply comes to an end like the old Whig party, and then we get another center-right party in its place. Maybe Haley could have, uh, you know, a hope for leadership in such a vehicle later. But thinking that this Republican Party that elected that guy, from, uh, what Mark Robinson, I guess his name is, the, the would-be Republican governor of North Carolina, uh, you know, the, the 140-odd Republicans who voted to not to certify Biden's victory in 2020, uh, the, the party that's supporting uh, Carrie Lake in Arizona after she lost the governor's race there the last time, supporting her for the Senate. That Republican Party is going to be the future for Nikki Haley? No, that's not going to happen. And I would like to see that faction stop pretending that it will, and it might have a good effect. The 2028 thing is so hilarious. If, just as you note, if she, if Biden wins, Trump, it's still Trump's party. She's not going to be. All of a sudden, they're going to say, "Trump, we've had it with you. We've lost too many elections with you. We're going to with Nikki Haley." And then, of course, if Trump wins, we're never going to have another free and fair election anyway. There's no 2028 for her. He's not retiring. He's not leaving. Um, So that's crazy. Uh, Phil, with regard to Republicans for Biden, we cannot count on these electeds because they are all but for Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and Mitt Romney. They're not they're unwilling to throw their careers away. So he has no strength without their weakness, but they he has so much of their weakness. So he has so much strength. And well, looking at Chris Christie and Nikki Haley and Asa Hutchinson and, and how this sort of shakes out, wh- what, do you, what do you see? Because I, I look at Christie and I think he wants to be relevant, right? So he's going to come around and he's going to endorse Joe Biden, just like Liz Cheney is going to. She's telegraphed that she's going to because he wants to be in the mix. I don't think he's going to just go home quietly. Um, and he's not pretending he's the future of, the, of a Republican Party like Damon described. So. So, so what do you think? What do you think Nikki Haley will do? What do you think this kind of weakness in Trump's turnout um, does? The, 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 the thing, the thing that I always go back to is in 2022, more Republicans turned out and voted than Democrats. Just a lot of them voted for Democrats. Uh, so they're there, um, and and so it's but they need. They need people to come out and say something. And I see Asa squirming around and Nikki being mysterious. And what's your, what's your sense of sort of where, how much, I don't know, how much Biden can pull in some public statements from Republicans, even if they don't endorse him, saying, I'm just not going to vote for Trump. What's your what's your what's your vibe? Um, okay, so I think it's unlikely. So let me I'm gonna I'm gonna be a bit of a contrarian here. I don't think Nikki Haley ran a good campaign. I don't. I went to okay. New Hampshire. She you know that was her make or break moment. She had nothing on the ground. She wasn't doing anything. She got lucky. She stuck in the race even though she'd already lost. And as a result of sticking in the race, she got a lot of people who wanted to send a message to Donald Trump to come out and vote. Right in two of the three places where he had exit polls on Tuesday, most of her vote came from people who weren't Republicans. It was independents and Democrats crossing party lines to come out and send this message. And so that also is why I don't think Donald Trump is as weak as people are portraying it, because those people were never going to vote for Donald Trump. They came out to try and block Donald Trump. They're not going to vote for him in November. Right? right? They were never going to do that. They weren't like, oh, I'm trying to decide between the two. They were trying to send a message. Right. And so I don't think that weakness exists. And I think when we look at, you know, I mean, to go back to the the, 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 the cab driver. Right. I think that's a good example of a, of a worldview that's out there that you are choosing between two people. And there are a lot of people in the Republican Party who, yes, understand that Donald Trump is erratic, maybe even find him dangerous, but also understand that on a day-to-day basis, what the president does is 
potentially sign into law legislation and appoint people to the Supreme Court and appoint you know judges to the bench. And that is the thing that they're looking at. And so I don't think there are a lot of Republicans who are going to come out and say, yes, I support Joe Biden because Donald Trump's dangerous. They're going to either say nothing or they're going to come out and endorse Trump because they want those judges and they want that legislation signed. And I think that is fair, right? It is fair to view the presidency, particularly if you are skeptical that this long tail event of Donald Trump disrupting American democracy to a significant extent will actually occur, which I also think, you know, it is a long tail risk. It's not like if he's elected immediately, American democracy is going to collapse. Like we all understand that. If you are willing to take that bet and figure we can get by for another four years and get some more, you know, maybe get a seven to two majority on the Supreme Court and get more judges, like that's the bet that's being made. I don't know that what Chris Christie's going to do. Chris Christie does like attention, but he's also been quiet at times, right? So maybe he'll come out for Biden. I don't think it makes any difference. Uh, you know, I don't think there are a whole lot of people who are waiting. You know, I mean, we saw that in the Republican primary. If people, if Republicans cared what Chris Christie was going to say, they were going to vote for him for president. They didn't. Uh, and they didn't in 2016 either, right? So, yeah, I mean, this is going to be a close election. And there may be things that happen at the edges which are significant, turnout being one of them, people crossing the lines being another. But to go back to this New York Times Siena College poll, Trump had more support from his party than Joe Biden did. I mean, it's within a margin of error. It's, you know, a percentage point or two. But it is not the case that Trump is uniquely disadvantaged by dissatisfaction with his party in a way that Biden isn't. And as such, I think there is, a, to an extent, a lot of this focus on healing and so on and so forth is just trying to figure out a scenario in which one can view the election as being more favorable to Biden than is probably warranted. Okay, Bill, um, I want to know if you agree with Phil. What is your assessment from the results of Trump's weakness? I would like to believe that there are reluctant Trump voters who still can be shamed. Um, what, what are your thoughts? I know that uh, there's an old maxim to the effect that the wish is the father to the thought. And I'm afraid that that, uh, that mental dynamic is at work here. I have to say I agree with Philip completely, and let me just put another New York Times finding on, on the table. Uh, Trump voters in 2020 and Biden voters in 2020. Of the people who voted for Trump in 2020, 97% say that they're going to be voting for Trump again, and 0% say that they're going to be voting for Joe Biden. Shift over to Biden, 83% of 2020 Biden voters said, I'm going to vote for him again. And 10%, you know, 10%, which is a meaningful number, say they're going to support Trump instead. Uh, so you know, I, think, I, I, I think that, you know, Phil's bottom line, namely that there, you know, not only are there no particular signs of weakness in the Republican coalition, but in fact, there are more signs of weakness in the Democratic coalition, or at least the people who voted for Biden in 2020, I think is absolutely correct. Uh, now, there is one caveat here, and this goes to Philip's point about what can happen in the next eight months. There is a pretty consistent strand of polling to the effect that if Donald Trump were to be convicted of a serious crime, that would move enough people at the margin uh, to make a difference, potentially enough to make a difference in the in the outcome of the election. Uh, that is not, you know, that's not a trivial event. It won't, it wouldn't be if it occurred, uh, and. Uh, you know, and a number of analysts have pointed out that Americans distinguish, as they should, between an indictment and a conviction. And that if, you know, and if a jury finds you guilty of something serious, that's something that people who are not totally in the tank for Trump have to take seriously. Okay, Linda, I do not believe that we will have any trial beyond Alvin Bragg's trial starting on March 25th. It will not be considered by a majority of this electorate choosing Trump in general election matchups a serious conviction, should he get it. We don't know if he will. I just don't think it's going to bum them out. It's not a serious crime. Republicans will tell them as they did before it's a bookkeeping error. And um, so where does that leave us? Because I want to believe that there are two-time Trump voters who turned on him after January 6th. There will not be a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And I know that Biden has lost, I know Trump has new converts, new Latino, black, and young converts. 
and that these voters who are not politically addicted are making their choices as Phil describes, especially the Republican ones. Well, I just need this regulation uh, I, I oppose, and I just need this judge. I understand that. <clears throat> but I do believe, because I know anecdotally, that there are two-time Trump voters who will not support him. Where do you think, um, do you think that he's weak and that the poll, and that these primary contests bore that out? Do you agree with Bill and Phil that actually, no, he's unified the party and Biden is the only one with weaknesses. I would like to think that there are those two-time Trump voters who are going to switch and suddenly uh, vote for Biden. But I think the number uh, of, of people who are going to do that is probably so minuscule that it's not likely to have an effect. And, and by the way, it would have to have an effect in those battleground states, because that's where the election is won and lost. So uh, they'd have to be in Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, et cetera. So if, uh, if they're not there and there are not, is not a critical mass of them, that's not going to do it. I know this is going to sound like I'm grasping at straws, and I am. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm grasping at straws. But I do see a mental deterioration in Donald Trump that is pretty striking. And I'm not just talking about his constantly uh, referring to President Obama instead of President Biden, which he's done so many times now that he has uh, decided that uh, he should say that it's intentional and that they're indistinguishable because, of course, he's, you know, doing the uh, the dog Branding. whistle there, right? <laughs> uh, and, you know, he, 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 he might get away with it with his true believers. But he's not only made those kinds of mistakes. There was um, a speech he gave in the last couple of weeks. I'm a little blurred on when it was because I was overseas and I was watching things mostly uh, in snippets. But he gave a speech in which he actually exhibited, I think, what uh, would be clinically termed aphasia. It wasn't that he couldn't remember the word or got the wrong word or, you know, a malapropism. He tried to say Venezuela, couldn't get it out. And he literally babbled. He made incomprehensible noises into the microphone and then went on. But, you know, I'm looking at that and, you know, I'm not a medical doctor, obviously, although I live in a family of a lot of doctors. Um, and I thought there, there's something really wrong here. And clearly the stress is building. And I see that stress of the trial, uh, the Alvin Bragg trial, is more significant than the testimony or anything that develops in this trial, I think the stress on Trump, just as the stress on him from these really gargantuan fines that have been leveled against him uh, in both his, you know, his financial against the company and for, for uh, misstating on its financial uh, forms, uh, the actual uh, value of his properties, etc., um, and in the in the e. Jean Carroll uh, verdict, uh, where he's having to to scramble for money. I mean, he called Elon Musk in, was hoping maybe Musk will help uh, bail him out, at least pour enough money, uh, which Musk now says he's not going to do in giving to the candidate, but he didn't preclude uh, giving money to a super PAC, et cetera. But this is really getting to Donald Trump, and it gets him where it matters in his pocketbook and in his definition of himself. So that's my that's my grasping at straws. I wish I could offer something uh, more encouraging with lots of data behind it, like Bill would, uh, but I can't come up with anything. I I think that's I think him slurring his words is significant. And if it happens again, it's going to be a real problem because the Democrats are certainly up to using social media to spread that around. So now let's talk about this question of whether or not the democracy issue, the threat of Trump as dictator, the promise he's made, Project 2025, he is an authoritarian, he wants to centralize power, he doesn't want to be checked by a Congress or courts or the Constitution. The New York Times writes yesterday or whenever, does, you know, does the public have collective amnesia about Trump or did they just dig it? It's fine. So we're all grappling with that question, right? How informed are people about things like his handling of COVID or whether or not he, he 
his role in January 6th and whether or not he was staging a coup for two months beforehand. So the New Republic writes the piece about the new polling that Jeff Guerin did about how once presented, a lot of voters don't know about any of this threat to the actual system. They think they live in democracy. It's all over them every day. And they don't think that they will lose it. And they don't understand what separation from it would feel like or look like. And that when presented with these specific threats, the voters, their their view of Trump changed and his unfavorables went up. So that's an opening for the Biden campaign. So I want all of you to weigh in on this. Do you have to talk about the kitchen table? And when you talk about Trump, you just make the voters more mad because he's priced in. What are your thoughts? And let's start, um, let's go down to Damon. Well, you know, I was a bit of a skeptic in 2020 about the decision of the campaign to emphasize the the democracy argument as much as as it did. And this was, of course, before January 6th. (laughs) Um, And and, you know, I given that Biden won and in the general, uh, you know, in the the uh, the popular vote, he did it by seven million votes. And so it, it seems in retrospect like that was definitely the right call. I know the Biden people uh, like to credit uh, the decision of Biden and his people in the midterms to really emphasize the democracy argument as the big reason why there was no red wave. You know, of course, also Dobbs, uh, they they note that too. Um, So, you know, based on that history, I guess I should sort of sit back and be like, all right, Biden people, if that's how you think you're going to win, uh, maybe you're right. Go ahead and do that. Um, my instincts, I will confess, are that I think there are limits to how much good it will do for the simple fact that I suspect, you know, if you could sit down with an ostensibly neutral pollster with one to one to one with voters across the whole country and explain the way democracy works and the process of of certifying votes and what exactly what Trump did and who he spoke to and the manipulation and what he wanted Pence to do and what John Eastman was saying and laid all of that out one to one with each voter. Do I think it could have a meaningful effect? Yeah, probably. You probably could get a whole bunch of people to say, you know, I didn't realize Trump really is dangerous. But that obviously isn't the way it's going to be. And I think for low information voters, we're dealing with what you might call uh, what if 9-11 never happened problem. So, like, remember... George W. Bush received intelligence that there might be something going on, a potential terrorist attack, a really big one by al-Qaeda. And he didn't act on it. Of course, there was intelligence noise. There are always threats of things swirling around. And so people ask, like, well, God, what if you listen to that? And what if they, like, found the flight school and arrested Mohammed Atta and everybody and the other major hijackers, and we never get 9-11? What would have been the political consequence of that? I would say nothing. It would have been like a blip in the news that nobody paid attention to because 9-11 is only this terrible thing we wish never happened because it happened. (laughs) And so I think a lot of low information voters hear the Democrats going on and on about the danger of Trump. And maybe in 2020, you know, in the swirl of the chaos of the Trump administration and, and COVID and everything and all the investigations, people were sort of receptive to this. And then ironically, even though we had January, January 6th, which was so much worse than anything that had happened before, most voters are probably like, yeah, whatever. Like, you know, Biden became president and he's president and and nothing terrible happened. In fact, I felt richer then and I got all these great checks with Donald Trump's signature on them. And like and and so they sort of I I fear a, a kind of chicken little problem of People saying like, yeah, 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 you're always saying that, that it's going to be so terrible. But he was president for four years and what terrible thing happened? 
uh, actually, my life was a little better then. And so I'm inclined to say, yeah, 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 stop, t- stop saying that. That's what I worry about, the kind of, it, it just being a little, like, not sufficiently salient to, to change these underlying trends that we've been talking about on the show up till now. So I, but then again, I'm, I am Damon Downer and that's my brand. So, you know, hey, take man. it for what it's yeah. worth. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm your grim twin. Okay. <laughs> so Phil, we do know in 2022 that these Republicans who went to the polls and voted for like popular governors, obviously in Texas and New Hampshire and uh, Georgia and, and Ohio uh, in swing states voted down election deniers, specifically all of them, Secretary of State, gubernatorial candidates, they discerned this issue was salient. So where do you come down on whether or not, I mean, how the Biden can use it, abuse it, overuse it? The the polling, the Jeff Karen Garen polling thing is interesting. And Damon is right. We can't sit everybody down and like do like, you know, how a bill becomes a law with them. But is there a way to, I know they're going to start talking about it, right? We were told that the, the Biden administration is going to try to like market Project 2025. Do you mm-hmm. think that this will make a difference? Yeah, um, two things I'd say. The first is that uh, the, the central question is that communication, right? Uh, Damon used the expression low information voters. I think it's more accurate to say bad information voters, right? That right. there are people who listen to Fox News and are immersed in right wing social media and just get bad information, get lies all the time, get dishonest representations of what's going on in the world. They believe that crime is soaring. They believe that all these various things happened, right? Uh, and it's just not true. Uh, but it is presented over and over on Fox News, presented over and over in Donald Trump Jr.'s Twitter feed and whatever it happens to be that these things are going on. That's the impermeability that. I think is the challenge, right? So even if you had a pollster sit down, and we see this on Fox News, Bernie Sanders, there's this very, very striking example. Bernie Sanders sat down with Fox News, I think it was in 2020, it might have been even after that, and had this town hall meeting with him for an hour, and then the next two hours straight were them picking apart what Bernie Sanders had said. And so he'd like, he went on the show and had this conversation, and then Fox News just ripped it apart, because that's what they do, right? So right. this is the universe in which Biden is trying to make traction. I wrote a piece after he won that his main opponent, the right-wing media, media universe was still undefeated, that he had beaten Trump, but there was still this thing that he had not managed to conquer. The other thing that I'll say is that Biden is different than a secretary of state in a state, right? No one knows who the secretary of state is. No one cares who their secretary of state is until it's election day and they do a little Googling and they say, oh, you know, that's, that's different than the presidency. People have views of Biden and Trump. Informed well, poorly informed, it doesn't matter. They have a view. They understand it, right? And so you're already working against an understanding of who Joe Biden is. Joe Biden doesn't just have to come out and say, hey, I'm Joe Biden. You never heard of me, and here's what I stand for. He's got to come out and say, hey, I know you don't like me, and maybe you like this other guy who I'm also running against and who you also have preconceived notions of, and here's my presentation of why he'd be bad and I'd be good within this universe where Donald Trump is is robustly bolstered by all this chatter that is just nonsense and misinformation, right? So, yes, I am sure, to Damon's point and to the point of that poll, that if you tell people, here are the things that happened and here are the concerns that actual experts have about what might happen should Donald Trump be reinaugurated in 2025, that people say, oh, those all those sound bad, right? The challenge is, not only would you have to sit down with everyone with that pollster, you'd also have to do it two seconds before they vote. Because <laughs> otherwise, they're just re-immersed in the bad information universe, and then things go sideways again very quickly. Oh, so true. Bill, what do you think? I have a slightly different view. Uh, I note two things. Number one, the threat is real. It's not made up. And it is easy to show, you know, based on publicly released plans for 2025, uh, that the the think tanks and the senior aides that, that have rallied behind Trump, uh, I've been thinking very carefully, uh, for example, about the use of the Insurrection Act, yeah. you know, which is a perfectly legal vehicle for what in effect is the declaration of martial law in the United States. Uh, and there are various other things that can be documented. Uh, The second point is that Joe Biden believes it, right? And so this argument passes the authenticity test, 
right? He can be passionate about this. And the same way that he was passionate in 2020 about, you know, the conflict between democracy and autocracy being the major issue, issue in the world. I think it's always better when a candidate says what he passionately believes to be the case, right? Because, you know, you know I think it was you who used the word phony about Nikki Haley. I mean, if, you know, people can, you know, people can smell phony arguments. They can smell purely political arguments that are ginned up, you know, for political purposes. Uh, the third point is this. Joe Biden, in my judgment, is not going to win the economic argument. And I have all sorts of reasons for believing that, but that would take us too far afield. And my information, what it's, for what it's worth, is that he's going to punt on immigration tonight. That is to say that he is not going to announce a bold step. That he is going, in effect, to say the Republicans should have passed the, uh, the tripartisan bill that was worked out in the Senate, and he's going to call on them to do that, which the House won't. Uh, and, uh, and then he's going to lay out the elements of his, his own preferred program. I'm afraid that the reaction to that is going to be very negative, uh, because there are a bunch of Democrats who believe that he ought to announce a temporary border closure and should already have announced it. Uh, and he will be seen as having flinched in the face of pressure from the advocates, including the advocacy groups in his own administration. So what's he going to campaign on? Uh, I've just ticked off the two top issues in the minds of the American people. Uh, I don't think he has any choice but to emphasize democracy and abortion slash IVF because uh, I don't think he's in a particularly strong position to engage on the other arguments that are top of mind for the American people. Linda, what do you think? Do you, I mean, this is, I think it's been effective, but I understand why voters tune it out they don't, they, and, and the campaign consultants say it's not going to work. You got to talk to them about their, their, the price of eggs. What, what do you think? Well, I, do? I think actually that there has to be a combination. I actually think the democracy issue is a winning issue, but it has to be presented as a kitchen table kind of discussion. And that's where abortion works. Because you have all of these people, including um, a couple that were forced to leave the state of Texas in order to uh, have an abortion uh, with a pregnancy that was going to fail and that endangered the mother and in which the baby, if it were actually born alive, would live a maximum of a week. When you can make those stories real and you can try to get people to understand that this isn't a theoretical discussion. This isn't, you know, going back to Philadelphia and, and discussing the difference between democracy and republic and representative government and two houses of Congress. They're not the kind of academic, uh, very abstract kind of discussion. This is something that affects your life. And abortion does that. I would disagree a bit with Bill uh, on immigration. He and I have disagreed. Uh, we've, we've sort of reversed roles. Bill is to my right. <laughs> I'm on the left on this issue on the podcast. But I would talk about immigration. First of all, I think talking about the way the Republicans killed what was necessary in order to give uh, Joe Biden the, the tools to be able to act more forcefully. But there's another issue, and that leads us to this Project 25. Americans are worried about those people flooding in, but throughout America, whether you're talking about, you know, even red states, places like Iowa, immigrants have revitalized rural America. They buy homes, they buy cars, they start businesses, and people have in their community people whom they know they may go to church, evangelicals, a very, very strong presence of evangelical Hispanics in various parts of the country, particularly in rural areas. If you can dramatize 
what Donald Trump wants to do. It isn't just that he wants to stop people from coming in. He wants to take people who've been here 20 years, established lives here, own their homes, started a business, are actually employing other people. He wants to round them up. He wants to put them in tents in the desert. And he wants to, with absolutely uh, no due process at all, ship them back to the country he thinks they ought to uh, be living in. Uh, and sometimes that's going to involve people who are not even here Ill illegally, because that's what's happened every time we've had those kind of mass roundups. People who are either legal residents or uh, were born in the United States, but may not have, you know, their birth certificate. I don't carry mine uh, or my passport with me most days. Uh, they're going to end up uh, in these camps. I think if you can dramatize that and get home the message that these are your neighbors, these are the people whose restaurants you go to, these are the people who um, who you sell cars to, etc. Uh, and understand that somebody who is going to take dictatorial power to do something that is not within the law uh, in order to get rid of these people. I think that kind of message could play. And I think it's going to take Hollywood to do it. And by the way, the last time I checked, Hollywood was very much in the Democratic uh, side of the ledger. And I uh, believe that they could come up with some very, very effective ads on abortion and even on the immigration issue that could be effective. Okay, it's time for our um, low light or highlight of the week. And I'm going to start with Bill. Well, it won't surprise the faithful listeners of Beg to Differ that I have yet another low light. Uh, and it won't surprise them either that, involve, that it involves uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. While we dither about renewing aid to Ukraine, it is literally the case that Ukraine is running out of the ammunition that it needs to hold the lines that it has held at such extraordinary human price for the past year. Uh, the Russians uh, are moving forward in a number of areas where uh, you know, they are outgunning the Ukrainians 10 to 1 in artillery shells where Ukrainian soldiers have been told to save their ammunition from their guns and their, you know, and their rifles and their machine guns for large groups of Russians. And if you see one or two Russians moving forward, don't waste your bullet. You know, it makes, it really, I don't want, it makes me want to howl and it makes me want to cry, right? These are people who are prepared to surrender their lives in defense of freedom and independence and democratic self-government. They're not asking us to shed a drop of blood. All they're asking us for is the tools to do the job. And we're not giving them to them. Shame on us and shame on the Speaker of the House. Amen. Damon. Well, here's going to be a case where I'm going to give you a highlight, and I suspect it's a highlight that uh, a plurality or majority of our listeners will consider a low light. But uh, hey, well, it's all called big to differ, isn't it? This week, it's really amazing what a big news week it was for politics that we had this really huge Supreme Court decision on Monday, and it hasn't even come up. Um, the Supreme Court ruled nine to zero that we, uh, we cannot disqualify Donald Trump for uh, the presidency using uh, the uh, third uh, section of the 14th Amendment. And I have to say, uh, thank goodness. I, I have been deeply ambivalent all along about the kind of lawfare approach to trying to save us from Donald Trump, making the case over and over again that he is a, a, he is a political problem who must be defeated politically. And if he cannot be defeated politically, then uh, woe, woe betide the United States. But um, this particular gambit of using the 14th Amendment to kind of rid us 
uh, of Trump, uh, I have found from the moment it was put forth, I, I've, I've thought it was uh, completely indefensible and, and uh, just unpersuasive. Uh, and I hoped and prayed and suspected that the Supreme Court would agree with me. And the fact that John Roberts was able to get uh, all nine justices on board with at least the per, per curiam portion of the decision, I think, is very good. I very much support it. And um, I say, uh, I say, uh, ixnay to all of the naysayers out there who kind of were uh, rending their garments about this uh, in a display of peak this week. Um, I was pleased by it. And I think it is, even if it means uh, we get Donald Trump reelected. I think that is better than trying to remove him from the political scene by uh, summarily declaring him uh, invalid as a candidate. Um, and obviously, that's a big, a big thing. We could debate for a long time. We're not going to do it. But that's where I come down, at least. Phil. So the, the real highlight of my week was my seven-year-old coming home from school with this assignment saying that you know, explaining what he's going to be like when he's 100 years old and saying that he wants to be a surfer in California with blue hair that wears sunglasses. That was the high, actual highlight of my week. Uh, from a work perspective, the highlight of my past seven days, to use week more loosely, has been the second collapse of the House impeachment probe, right? The first collapse was the, obviously people probably know this by now, uh, that the inf the supposed informant who alleged that Biden and Hunter Biden taking a bribe was revealed to have made the whole thing up and indicted by the Department of Justice. The secondary collapse was the interview with Hunter Biden that occurred last week. The transcript for it came out and made very obvious that not only was there no real case, but that Hunter Biden was, was very deftly able to sort of brush things away. Uh, and it's sort of fascinating now to watch Republicans uh, particularly James Comer, the head of the Oversight Committee, trying to scramble and figure out how they're going to resuscitate this thing that there's so much demand for. Even just last night, he's on Hannity and you know trying to really pump the pump the pump the machine here and trying to get get people engaged in this idea that something wrong happened, and he just keeps tripping over his own toes just because he has nothing to work with and he never has. Uh, and so I think it is good uh, that there is now more evidence that this whole thing, which was obviously contrived from the outset, was in fact contrived and that it is making Republicans have to deal with the embarrassing scenario of their having gotten way out over their skis on this thing. It's going to be an interesting part of the next eight months, which are so dreadful, um, to watch them not be able to have a, vo a vote on the House floor because they don't have the goods and they have to sort of keep the investigation going, but they don't really know why or how. Linda, how about you? Well, you know, this show is called Beg to Differ. And uh, if uh, a listener is, is hearing the show for the first time today, they're going to have a very confused picture of which of us is left of center and which of us is right of center because I beg to differ strongly with my friend Damon Linker uh, on this week's Supreme Court decision. I was that was my real low light of the week. Um, I am a textualist and an originalist. I believe the text, the words matter in what they say. Uh, I believe the history matters, and I think Donald Trump is and would be uh, Jefferson Davis uh, if he could. And in fact, he. Uh, tried to lead uh, an army into the Capitol to take over. I think it was his bone spurs that prevented him from marching up the avenue to, to lead uh, that attack. Uh, but I, I think that was a low light, and it was further exemplified in an article I'm going to recommend to our listeners, The Fallout of Trump's Colorado Victory by John Hendrickson that appeared in the Atlanta Atlantic, and it's all about uh, the Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold, who, um, you know, was sort of front and center on that, even though I think she was a defendant uh, in uh, the suit because it was, you know, she was the one who was going to have to put the name on the ballot or not. And this was an article about how Jenna Griswold's life has changed, and it was shocking. Um the kinds of abuse that she has had to put up with. Uh, I will read you a, uh, an edited uh, version of one of the calls that she received, hoping that some effing immigrant from effing Iran cuts the heads of her kids off and that somebody shoots her in the head. That was one of the milder of uh, the kinds of uh, things she had to put up with uh, just for being somebody who had to ultimately make the decision, keep 
Donald Trump on the ballot or not. And uh, I think this shows what terrible state uh, our democracy is in. When people who do the ordinary jobs of going to the polls on election night and helping count the ballots end up like Shea Moss and, and, um, and her mother, uh, Miss Ruby, Lady Ruby, uh, end up having their lives turned upside down. Uh, this, to me, is uh, really one of the scariest things that we've seen. I don't recall a time in all of my political life when I have seen this kind of animus directed, this kind of violent rhetoric uh, directed to people uh, that disagree uh, on a particular uh, candidate. And I, I think that's, that's my low light for the week. And no doubt Nikki Haley will be considering when she decides what to say about Donald Trump, how much she's going to spend out of her personal finances on security per day for Mitt Romney, it's 5,000. Um, Mitch McConnell can afford it, um, but he still endorsed Trump. But it is a, it is And that was now. my other low. I forgot. I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, A.B., yeah. because that's my other low light. I was hoping against hope that uh, the reason that he yeah. was stepping aside from his minority leadership position was so that he could not endorse. I got proved wrong on that. I, w- I was grasping with you, Linda, on that. Well, my um, low light is um, my favorite exit poll finding from Nikki Haley's final night on Super Tuesday of North Carolina Republican voters. Does Nikki Haley have the physical and mental health needed to serve as president? 58% yes, 39% no. Does Trump? Yes, 76%. No, 22%. And anyone on Twitter this week has seen some very interesting um, misogynistic interviews um, about whether or not Nikki Haley or a woman could serve the only one I can repeat is the woman in the diner who openly told the Fox interview interviewer that she was concerned about Nikki Haley being in menopause. So um, that's that's uh, I just want to know. I just want to emphasize that the cruelty is the point, but the misogyny is also one of the baked in points of MAGA that um, is truly still in 2024. Just staggering to me. I love this conversation. Thank you all for joining me. It was a delight to fill in for Mona. She will be back. Uh, Next week, thank you all for joining us.